Freddie. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Al Bond. I'm the CEO of the Avalon Foundation. Um, I want to welcome everyone here to the awards announcement for Small Painting Sunday and also our judges talk. Um, it's been an incredible week. Once again, when I think about the fact that none of this existed a, a week ago and all these wonderful paintings, I'm just really overwhelmed by yeah, the fabulous yeah, artists that, that come and visit our community once a year and, and participate in this event. Um, I'm so grateful also to the Avalon's army of volunteers. <laughs> a lot of people have given of their time and work to, to be able to be here and uh, to, to make this event happen. And, and so, yeah, yeah, it really is a community organization and a community event. And yeah, it wouldn't happen without all those good folks giving of their time. So th thank you all. Um, this Small Painting Sunday event is one that is in honor of a really special person. Uh, her name was Susan Bryce. She was a board member, a friend. She was an art collector. And um, we brought you know, this you know, event to, into being, I think, maybe six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, and it has become really integral to Plenary Easton and a really fabulous way to end a really great week. Um, I often say words about Susan, um, and this year we have asked that her daughter Allison come and, and say a few words yeah, about Susan and her life and yeah, how she was such a central part of yeah, the growth of this, yeah, this festival. So Allison. Yes. Yep. Bring it down. Thank you, Al, and a very big thank you to Ellen Vatne, Denise, and John Bodie for sponsoring Small Painting Sunday this year. What a wonderful, wonderful day, so thank you. <laughs> Jessica, I don't know where you are, and Al, and everyone on the Avalon Foundation, you all know how to put on an amazing week, wow. And all of the artists who participated, you certainly know how to dazzle us each and every year. We are mar marveled by the work that you do. Our judge is going to be speaking with us shortly about the technical beauty of all of the paintings around us. But I want to speak to you about the importance of Small Painting Sunday and how it relates to my mother. You know, it's interesting. I have talked to so many different people about how they connect her, and some connect her through the paintings themselves and the intricacies of them. But for me, and I know my mother, it's the joy that this day brings. It's the energy in the room. It's the music. It's the beauty of each and every one of these beautiful paintings. And it's the idea that everyone can bring art into their home. That is what she strongly believed. So I hope that each and every one of you have been able to experience that today. So thank you. Thank you, Allison, that was beautiful really captured your mom a lot. Um, hi, I'm Denise Grant. I'm the new chair of the board of the Avalon Foundation and want to thank you all for coming here today. The culmination, uh, this is truly standing room only. It's always crowded, but I think this is really a, a really remarkable turnout today. Thank you all for coming. Um, there are so many thanks, uh, and I'm going to give some thanks but I'm going to leave out people, so please forgive me. I didn't bring any notes up here, so I know I will forget people. First, as Al said, the army of volunteers and the volunteers that are here today in the aprons, the people who have been around all week, the people that are hosting artists in their homes. I mean, that adds up to about 200 people volunteering to help out at this event. So it truly... 
It truly takes a village, and um, we could not do this without you. I also want to give a huge, huge round of applause and hold till, till, the, till the end, and I'm going to forget people. I shouldn't do this, but um, the Avalon, staff founda Avalon Foundation staff for putting on this event. And I'll uh, give a particular shout out to Marie Nuttall, who everybody has seen around and is here this afternoon. If you don't know Marie, she is the plein air coordinator uh, from the Avalon Foundation staff. And um, her job for next year will start tomorrow. <laughs> It'll be plein air 2023. So, uh, but in addition to Marie on staff, we've got Al, Jessica, Susie, Tim, Nick, Sean, Diana, Kimberly, and I am, know I'm leaving somebody else out. Want to thank Carol Sleeper, our volunteer coordinator. We all know, actually, this whole week, who's really in charge, and that's Carol. <laughs> we, we, we report to duty for you. Um, also want to thank all the artists for coming this week. Uh, this would not happen without you. We had an incredible group of artists that had created an incredible body of work this week. Uh, I want to encourage everybody who's here to before you leave to make another round through here and to also go back over to the Academy Art Museum to take a look over there at the competition paintings. There are some fabulous paintings that are still for sale. And I know from experience, if there's something that's speaking to you, if you buy it, you won't regret it. But if you don't buy it, you will regret it. So <laughs> just wanna encourage everybody to do that because, um, you know, but run, don't walk because the event's going to close in about two hours. So um, without further ado, I want to thank um, our wonderful judge this year, Julia Marciani Alexander. She's this week, she's just done an incredible job, and she's become a real friend of Plein Air. Uh, like all the donors too, I should, I, I did forget to thank the donors and I want to go back, I want to rewind before I introduce Julia and thank the donors because this obviously could not be done without you. Um, we also have a past judge here. We have uh, Dan Weiss who was our judge last year. So thank him for his continuing support. So I want to just say a few words about Julia. She wanted just a fabulous human being. I feel like I've, I've, I've gained a new friend this week. Um, and she runs the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. And if you haven't been, I encourage you all to go. It's just a short drive away. Um, interesting thing about Julia, she got an undergraduate degree in two, two degrees, French and in art. Then she got two masters, one in French and one in art. So clearly there was a battle going on between French and art, but then art won. She went on to get her PhD in art from Yale and um, then began a career in uh, arts management. She was at the Yale Museum, then she went to the San Diego Art Museum before then coming back in this direction and uh, uh, joining the Walters about 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago. So Crazy. time has flown. We are delighted that she is here today to talk to us about why she made the selections and also to announce the award winner for Small Sunday Painting Day. So, Julia. Yay, thank you. So I'm not used to, um, I guess I have the Britney Spears microphone, so <laughs> I'll just put that down. Um, am I doing just the award, the number so one we're, we're winner? Doing the Okay, I might need those because I have the sheet with just the winner. I only have the sheet with the winner, so I'm going to read from here. Oh, wait, I don't need the microphone, so I can do this. <laughs> I'll start singing. Um, so I would really like to um, congratulate all the artists before I start, and I especially would like to congratulate the artists who I did not select because all of you made this an incredibly exciting competition, both in the small paintings, well, not both, in the small paintings, in the quick draw, and in the main competition, each of you has a, an amazing capacity for vision and creativity. And wow, you guys made my weekend hell. 
So I salute all of you, the artists who win, the artists who didn't win, and I just really want to say thank you for including me. So small paintings, I am um, really excited to announce honorable mention. And this honorable mention goes to Carl Terry. Do they come up? Okay, you need, it's, it's a little bit easier than the quick draw in that we're in this small space, but you got to get your painting, which is Sunrise at Tillman Island, and then come up, and while you're doing that, I will thank Ellen Votney and Denise and John Bodie, and I think I got those names correct. Um, so thank you so much, Ellen and Denise and John, for sponsoring this incredible award, and Carl, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, cheers. Exactly. Here you go. Awesome. We'll see you later. Oh, wait. Wait. You want that. The handshake's nice, but really, yeah. All right. The next honorable mention in, uh, for this Small Painting Sunday goes to Keith Thurgood, um, also sponsored by Ellen Botney and Denise and John Bodie. And this work is for Quiet Backwater. Do -do. And the answer is Keith Thurgood. <laughs> nice, thank you so much. So good. I should have said, who is Keith Thurgood? Wait, wait, you know, you want this. Uh-huh. Yeah, you do. Congratulations. All right. Now to the actual places. Um, third place goes to Gary Tucker for <laughs> Cafe Limoncello. And it's sort of too bad that the beautiful swoosh with the third place name um, here is over the little splodge, that's a very technical painting term, um, of yellow that was the key to the limoncello. So I encourage you to come and look at it. Is Gary here, Gary Tucker? Yes, yay, he's getting the painting. Yay, Gary! All right, show us the splodge. Yes, come over here. Yes, the yellow. Look at that, you gotta look at the birdie. All right, so great, thank you. And you get a thing and then the thing and there you go. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. This is so much fun. I'm never going to give this thing up. Okay. Second place in today's Small Painting Sunday is for Beth Bath. <laughs> Clearly. I gave this an award because it allows me to speak French. Um, <laughs> for Les Pommes. Yay, Beth. Yay, Beth. Congratulations. Congratulations. So this is yours. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And so, um, before I give out the last one, are these now on view in the spaces? They're Is that all, correct? They're all in this room, and they're the top paintings, or the small paintings. And they're still for sale. Okay. <laughs> so again, for those of you who did not hear, because Al does not have this beautiful thing, um, the top paintings are the small paintings that were submitted for Small Painting Sunday. So in your whip around at the end, you need to look particularly at those. It was such a spectacular event for me, personal, quiet interaction in a room with these small paintings the other day. So thank you for giving me that, that experience too.
All right, so today's uh, first place award uh, for the Small Painting Sunday is to Cynthia Rosen for Morning Light. So as an art historian, I will say that, you know, people say, well, I don't know why we have to go look at the real thing. Um, you know, the slide just does fine and then you're not. I had an art history professor who actually said these words. I don't want you to get distracted by the real thing. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. But Cynthia, this does not do justice to this amazing painting. So that's the point of that story. Cynthia, it is terrific, and congratulations. Come on up. You have to come up. You have to, can you come up? Yeah, okay, good. It was really terrific. Thank you. I want you to particularly look at the volumes um, in the way that she manipulated the paint on the, on the support. It's really the use of color was just so thrilling. So thank you. All right. And with that. With that, do I have a little, um, do I, can I use this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Cause, and then if you want to move down or however you want to move. Okay, we're voting. It's participatory. You want me up top or down at the bottom? Okay. All right, see, we did that really well. That was good. All right. Okay, before I begin, I do want to just say a, a few thank yous. Al Bond cold called me about two and a half, three years ago. Um, yeah, and he said, do you want to do this? And I said, no. Um, and then he called me back and he said, do you want to do this? And I said, mm. and then he said, look, um, it's a weekend in Easton. And I said, oh, okay. But really, that's not true. He said, he called me and I said, absolutely, this sounds great. But um, I do want to say, Al, thank you for your friendship over the past two years, three years, however long. Oh, my gosh. Um, and in fact, that friendship was based on email and one phone call. So you're awesome in person, too. Thank you. So Al, yay, thank you. And then Al's team has been amazing. I call them the pink, uh, the pink apron brigade. And I know it's not nice, but I have had particularly wonderful long-term um, interactions with Jessica and Marie. Marie and I sweated together yesterday for an hour and a half while she was like, could you please do this faster? No, she never once said that. So that, thank you, Marie. And thank you, Jessica. Is Jessica here? No, maybe not. Well, Jessica was really, I've been having a horrible, horrible time lately. And Jessica said to me, you know what? This is your weekend. This is going to be exactly what you need. I gotcha. And that was exactly what I needed to hear. So thank you, Jessica. Jessica, yay. I have three more thanks. One is to, the next is to all of you donors who make this possible. This is an incredible event, not just for the judge or for all the artists, but it truly is, as I said the other day, this is an incredible event, not only for artists in this country, but for Easton, for the Eastern Shore of Maryland, for Maryland, and really for this country. You all have done an incredible job at supporting a hugely important group of individuals who play a huge part in our economy in this country, which is the artistic community. That then supports the economy of a city, and that uplifts us all, not just in terms of what the economy is doing, but in terms of how we feel about ourselves as human beings. So donors, Thank you so, so much. And then finally, I said three, and in fact it's two. I'm not very good at math. Um, I want to thank my hosts, Julie and Joe Warren. Um, Julie and Joe have made me feel welcome also from the single minute that I arrived and met Julie. And she, too, um, was, it was like kismet. We had this amazing bond from the very, very beginning. And I just want to announce to you both that I'm moving in. <laughs> and my two friends from England, Charles and Marina, they're also moving in. So thank you. It's so great to be part of your home now. But really, truly, thank you. 
And then also just to the artists, what an incredible weekend. It really was hard. It really was so rejuvenating and refreshing to be among you. And one thing that we are trying to do at the Walters is truly to, to bring the people back into the art. Um, and so this festival, this weekend, is exactly what we should be thinking about as um, individuals involved with the arts and just human beings. Art doesn't happen if there's not an artist behind it. And we are all artists somehow, but those people who spend their hours and their days doing this, even if it's a second job, or if it's their primary job, or if it's a doodle, right? You know, you all are the ones that give us the ability to see ourselves differently and to live our lives differently. Um, and I just want to say thank you. And I just thank you, thank you, thank you. So I've spent a lot of time this weekend saying that I um, am, uh, you know, that, that I, we're all artists, but really I truly am not an artist. Um, I spent a lot of time talking about artists who have been dead for centuries. So not only am I not an artist, but I'm not a specialist in living artists. So this is a little bit different for me, um, and I just, I, it, is, it is a very, very different enterprise um, interacting with, it's joyous, but it is, it's a little bit intimidating when, you know, normally the artists that I talk about, they can't tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> so um, I just want to say thank you also, artists, because just bear with me as I tell lies about your paintings, okay? <laughs> so thank you. Um, all right, so... I am a specialist in um, old art. Uh, my field is French and British portraiture from the 17th century, um, and primarily also British art from, we used to say Holbein to Hockney. Um, Holbein has had a huge resurgence lately because of um, Wolf Hall and the Tudors and Six. So you can learn about Holbein, a 16th century um, British artist. Yes, he was German. But um, now we don't really talk about David Hockney anymore. We really talk about Damien Hirst as, the, as that. And now he's old school, too. So um, anyway, British art. Um, and so I'm really unqualified to talk about American paintings done yesterday. So just, just saying. I do, however, feel very strongly about plein air painting because unlike what we were taught in school, and we're now understanding that what we, ta what we were taught in school often isn't the full story, but as a specialist in British art, I have a very strong conviction that plein air painting did not just happen to start in the mid or early 19th century, particularly not just in France. Um, and then the Impressionists were the ones who really made it big. There were a lot of people who were doing that earlier, but also artists from the 16th, 17th, and 18th century um, were thinking about the land and the water in a way that was very different from how people had thought about land and water prior to that. And so I, as an art historian of that early period, have been engaged in um, looking at paintings by artists who might not have been painting outside, but very much were thinking about, as they were in the landscape and working with their patrons, how to depict the same kinds of subjects that you see on the walls. And so I, here, so I think it's, it's not just about where something is painted, but it is actually what is the trajectory of um, artists who are thinking differently and about how do you capture the land? How do you capture a moment um, that a moment in which you're looking at a country house in Britain from the bird's eye view, which in 1600, nobody could be a bird. There were no, I mean, really, there was no airplane. There was not even air balloons. People couldn't do that. And, you know, frankly, in England, the hills aren't so high. So, um, you know, I think it's really interesting to think that some of the earliest paintings, bird's eye view paintings, were people imagining the plein air experience, imagining that way of painting. So I just wanted you to, to sort of 
see that maybe I have a tiny bit of credibility um, in, in looking at these works, but also letting you know that I care deeply about figurative painting, which is an art that is so underappreciated in this country, in this world right now. Everything's all about abstraction. And I just want to say also thank you to the artists. So um, let's go. Am I starting with this one? This is the part of the, the world that I don't, this is unscripted. It's like um, the reality, it's called scripted reality TV, right? Scripted live TV. I'm totally unscripted, so this is not it. So um, Al, anyone? I'm supposed to have pictures. Do I start with the small painting Sunday? No. Oh, okay. There it is. All right. <laughs> the wizard. The wizard. He's got it. Yes. It's, it's, hi, wizard. Yes. Um, Vodio. Okay. So I'm sure that many of you were surprised that I have chosen one of the most um, really interesting paintings I found in the exhibition. Certainly it was the one that was incredibly eye-catching, and May is right here, um, but, but it was one that I felt really addressed issues for me. So this is not to say anything about what May's intent was. This is my subjectivity that, that are real and important in this moment. So this was a, it's a smallish painting, and it's called The Font of American Farmers. And even before I went up and read the title, I was trying desperately to kind of figure out what the artist was, was doing. Was the artist, and I'm going to talk about you as if you're not sitting there, um, was, was she he, intending to kind of portray in the foreground, into the middle ground, a kind of abstracted, on the level um, view of what's happening when the, far, when the wind hits the farm and how, how or, you know, hits the hay or hits the grass and it moves around and so you're, with the lights on it, that it, it, that it moves your, your eye around the, um, around the field before you get to the buildings and to the trees? Or was she really thinking about what's underneath the farm, what undergirds the work that happens in those buildings or in that landscape with the trees? Maybe it was both. Um, and unfortunately, she doesn't get to answer right now. But the thing that really struck me when I found out the font of American farmers, what I felt leaving leaving from this painting was just how perfect it was for this moment when the beauty and the glorious nature of the landscape and the, the role that farming plays in this country feels like it is melting in front of our eyes. And it feels like it is you know, potentially going into some sort of crevasse that's, that we're, we're moving towards. But it, it's still hopeful, right? So it could be the both and. And I was really intrigued by this, this swath or these, these lines of um, red that drew my eye over into the left. So again, she can tell me that I'm wrong. But this is what I felt um, was really interesting about the painting. And then on top of that, so that's the subject matter. But on top of that, I got very involved in looking at the way in which the paint was mixed, the way in which the paint was pulled across the canvas, and the way in which um, the colors drew your eye very quickly, but then intensely to different pieces in the painting. So May, congratulations. I really enjoyed that. So. And as we move to the next one, I will also just tell you that um, I view judging very much as, as subjectively objective or objectively subjective. You can never take how I was feeling when I walked in that room out of these selections. I jokingly and not so jokingly said if I had chosen on Friday, I may have chosen some different ones. There is no purely subjective, purely objective way to judge one of these competitions. And if anyone ever tells you that, they are so full of their own self-importance, art history, you know, quality, quality. You know, yes, there are some issues about quality that, that I as an art historian and trained might have 
opinions about, but really those kind of go out of, of the way when you're judging because you're drawn to images that catch your eye and then you begin to think about them. And that is how I um, really started to, to enter into the work. All right, this is a painting um, that also was a Judge's Choice Award. It's called It's Going to Clear Up. It's by Lori Marr, and it is fairly small, um, again, but as a specialist trained in, in sort of 17th century Dutch painting, this one really was personal for me. It felt very much like um, one of those early modern, so 16th to 19th century, views of water subjects either in Holland or in England that um, I study so well. And, and what I, frankly, what this painting did was it caught my eye and it made me happy. And so this was a Judge's Choice Award and it's beautifully painted and I just wanna say thank you to Lori. And um, so I, it's very, very well executed, and it was also just a personal choice. So thank you, Lori. When, you're, when you are looking at it, I think it's really amazing how she moves through, how she moves your eye through the canvas, um, and then she starts you out with, with something that's very um, flickery and the water in the front, and then she blocks it off with something solid and the house, and it's, you want to go in, but it's also impenetrable because it's the solid wall and then that, that block. And then so you go around to the side, and then you're off into the sort of mists in the back. And so she brings you through quietly this, this painting, but she also blocks you out. So I really appreciated that. Next, please. All right, so this is my third Judge's Choice Award. And I know this is a really controversial um, uh, choice, maybe, a little bit, because there's a, an idea that plein air painting is only outside subjects. But this one in particular, first of all, I could have a little conversation with anyone who wants to talk to me about plein air painting being outside <laughs> subjects only. Um, plein air means that you're painting it outside, but also this is an indoor-outdoor space. And this really does feel to me, um, it's by Charles Newman and it's called Miller Time. Um, but this to me felt like an incredible still life and at the same time an incredible, incredibly perilous um, I, felt, I felt sort of threatened as I was watching it, as I was looking at it. And that in particular was because as you stand, he's pulling you, you're almost being pulled over the saw through this incredible, and men, this incredibly menacing um, wheel. Yeah, there's no guard, I have no glasses on. And, um, well these, but they're not gonna do much. Um, but also, this is one where it, it's not only perilous because you're in front of this saw, but the building is falling down around you. So if it's not plein air now, it's gonna be plein air <laughs> in a week. And then this one in particular was one where I felt like it was the full experience. He very carefully and usefully and, and cleverly framed it in rough hewn um, pieces of wood that, that really brought home the idea of the totality of the experience that you would have. Um, it's also incredibly melancholic. Like the building, this theme of melancholy and peril, starting with May's, um, May's work, which is joyous peril, right, okay? Um, but this theme that, that we're really in a, on the precipice of something um, with this dilapidated space and that you feel like you might get pulled over the saw, the, the space might collapse around you, and yes, it is Miller time. <laughs> so I don't know what it says about me that it's not about being a Miller and you know that part of Miller time, but think about what I was thinking about getting. <laughs> you know. So I liked the humor in that as well. So thank you, Charles. All right, so um, this is for best use of light. And one of the most amazing things about this um, 
as a judge is that you have lots of ways to get lots of paintings um, into the winning category because there are so many donors who have chosen areas that they themselves are interested in. So the donor here, uh, Betty Huang at Studio B Gallery, clearly wanted us to think about you know, how artists use light. And so ha they've endowed or given a prize um, in this category along with a number of other categories. So I would say to all of you who have not been part of the um, category donor set, uh, think about what a category donor you might like to be and create your own award. Um, that would be super fun. Um, so best use of light. This is one that having grown up in Southern California and then gone back as an adult to work at the San Diego Museum of Art, um, I really felt a kinship with because it is the most California plein air of the works that I have seen in the show this time. And I loved the way that the dappling of the light in the foreground on the water um, was kind of struck through by this, this reflection of the sun, but framed also with these repoussoirs who are pushing you that way, but they're also not pushing you deeply into the middle of the picture, the trees. Um, and the California, school of, of painters ranging from Charles Rifle, who was an East Coast painter who ended up painting um, in San Diego, to Maurice Braun or Alfred um, Mitchell or William Went. These were all early 20th century painters who really were looking at the California landscape in a moment when that landscape was sort of new to all Americans. And so for me, this, this I don't even think, it may not have been painted by Deborah Hoos, and, and I'm sorry if I miss said that again for the 17th time, um, but I don't know if this is a California scene. It's definitely not because it's Chesapeake Morning Glow, but she's turned this, this East Coast view into something that for me felt very, very akin to the incredible work of early 20th century, quote unquote, impressionist painters who were all about the way that they turn paint into light. And so it's not just the subject, which itself is about the light. It is how the paint itself glistens off the, ca off the canvas in the impasto, um, in, the, in the water, and then up in the top register of the, of the of the canvas, it's actually quite dry. And so you have a very interesting um, distinction uh, but of what you are looking at between the wet and the dry. And I just I just love this and thought this was a great example of the best use of light. So congratulations, Deborah. I think this is the one that I've heard the most um, like, oh, about. Um, and I love this painting by John Brandon Sills. I love all the paintings, as you can imagine. But um, for me, this painting really was a, a throwback to the days when gold leaf, I mean, it is gold leaf that he has so deftly um, applied to the canvas and then used it to create, I think, some negative spaces with the red paint. And I just thought it was like looking at one of the amazing early, um, mid to early 19th century, early 19th century painters who were creating atmosphere across. George, George Innes comes to mind, Whistler comes to mind, those kinds of artists who weren't looking at the subject to depict the subject. They were looking at their materials to create an atmosphere. And I think this one, for me, just was, was so golden. Um, and, and I just, I know, womp womp. Um, I just really enjoyed this and thought that, that you know, John Brandon Sills is a Maryland artist, and I was, and Kate Quinn gave me the opportunity to give this painting um, the best Maryland artist picture. So John and um, Kate, thank you, Kate, and go John.
This is also one that's, and we're, we're gonna get into a number of things. Again, in art history, it's really hard because a lot of these works are much smaller or much larger than what you see here. So you're looking at them in a way that is very different, and I really, really encourage you to go and look at the real, at the real, the real deal. Um, so I was overwhelmed by how fantastic the watercolors in this selection were. And one of the things that I tried to do in my selection was to choose sets of work that were very different in their technique and to highlight different ways that artists work with the same materials. So the watercolors that are that I have selected represent very different ways of working and different use of media. So, um, and I am not smart enough to tell you what that is, but I can tell you the impressionists, the impressionists, the impressions that I get as an art historian looking at this work, which is by um, Thomas Bucci. It's for best watercolor, and this was sponsored by the Trippy Gal Trip Gallery. And um, what Thomas ha does in this really beautiful composition that, again, pulls you into the painting with this bike rider who's, who's bringing you in and the, the inviting lower right corner. But then he blocks it all off, and then he's using watercolor in a way that it's quite thickly, it has a lot of body, and um, each of the items, each of the subjects is rendered in a very different kind of um, texture. And he's using a highly textured paper so that the interplay between what he's putting on the paper and the paper create a kind of um, exciting dynamic for the subject. It makes it feel alive and also for your eye. So your eye kind of jumps around and you begin to look at each section of the painting or each each motif in the painting independently. And so you're not just going to be on the bike riding down that one path. You actually stop and take a moment and you look at the picket fence and how loosely that is painted. And then you look at the house, which actually is quite nubbly, um, another really important technical term that you learn in graduate school. Um, and then you look at the, t the way that the two trees are the two sets of trees are painted very, very differently. One quite intensely with two different colors, maybe even three or four different colors, and then very, very lightly in the background. That's nice, you know, yes, it's doing perspective, but it also makes you really stay in each area to think about where and what he's doing as a painter. So he's very present in this painting, and I just, I just loved this. So thank you, thank you, Thomas, and um, congratulations. All right, Nocturne. Um, this is Best Nocturne. Leslie Lobel and Eric Timsack have made this award um, come to life. And this one was challenging because like watercolors, there were lots of nocturnes. And as, with, as is the case with everything in this, in this selection, there were quite a number of really, really good contenders for this particular category. So you'll see there are some nocturnes that won in different categories as well, as with the watercolors. So this one I went back to a number of different times and kept, kept going back to the same thing, which is on the right-hand side, I felt that it was beautiful. It was really beautifully painted, and particularly the three spots of light that take your, take your eye from the middle of the left-hand side over to that sort of far away horizon with the, with the little um, beacon of light there, um, that the right-hand side was almost one composition. And then you had a completely different composition here in the, in the building and the lighting of the building on the left, but that somehow the artist, Tim Kelly, has, has made you see all of this as one composition and yet still, it, it feels kind of, and I'm saying this in a really happy way, Tim, please, it's kind of creepy, 
right? Um, because on the right-hand side, you think, oh, my gosh, this is such a beautiful, beautiful moment in the sky. And then you're a little bit afraid over here on the left. Um, because when you start looking, the, the wall of the house is beautifully rendered um, with just incredibly in tune brush strokes and different use of very subtle color gradations and then this stark, stark light at the top, which is the exact opposite of what's happening over here on this side. So he's using this contrast in the subject matter to take you from, you know, idle on the right side to a little bit of confusion and fear on the left side. And again, Tim, you can tell me that I'm completely wrong, but this is how I felt. And this was what I felt was actually so interesting about um, so a lot of these works, where they're really playing with this notion of what, what we hope is going to happen and what we feel might happen. So it's this toggle between hope and fear that is in in some of these paintings, and that came out particularly strongly in purple colored curtains. And the title makes you feel really good, right? And then there's that bit over there on the left that, you know, is this a gas station? I'm sure all of you know where this is. I don't, but um, again, kind of, kind of, kind of like, uh, not sure I want to go there. And it's purple colored curtains. I'm supposed to want to go there. Okay. Thank you. So, yay, Tim. Thank you. So this is um, an artist uh, who last year, I think, won the non-competition um, quick draw, Hema Gupta, and it's called Sunset on North Washington, and she was selected as the best new artist to Plein Air Easton. And um, so she had been here last year, but as a non-competition artist, and I didn't know that when I selected this, but she was on, she's just so great, and her watercolors are terrific. And this one was one where I, I really enjoyed the conceit that I was thinking was the conceit. So again, it might not be the conceit. But when I looked at this, I really enjoyed how she uses very thin washes, so very traditional watercolor technique that is not more in the English, the British type of watercolor where they, like Thomas Bucci, where the, you fill it with a lot of um, body, um, body material. Um, and this is much, much more fluid, and you can feel the water in this canvas, in, in this pa in this paper, um, work on paper. You feel, you almost feel the coolness of the water, or, you know, many of us watercolor occasionally, and we're always a little bit annoyed that the water was, there was too much water, right? And it ruined it. And she has done that spectacularly, manipulated just the perfect amount of water to create these areas of intense clarity, sort of this this person over here, or the the brushes, the brushwork here in the um, in the leaves, you feel like you are looking at something, even though they are somewhat abstract. Um, and then this incredible um, uh, kind of you you can't really see it's fuzzy, it's blurry. This car, the one little part of the car, or right here, where it almost feels like there's a sunspot coming out over the, um, over the red car. And what I felt like was that I was in a car looking through my windshield that I had just windshield wiped and that I was in the rain. And so here you have this, this play on you know, a sunset, again, hence the kind of sunspots, sunset on North Washington, but you feel like you're in a rainstorm looking through your car window, um, maybe waiting for someone. And it really spoke to me where the medium, the, the material and the medium was meeting the message. And I really appreciated that. So congratulations, Hema, um, for this, and welcome to Plan Air. And that's sponsored by the Y Financial Trust. Um, best architectural. This one was a, me being a little bit, um, you know, cutesy. Um, and because I felt like this was the architecture that was, again, kind of melting or disintegrating in front of our eyes. And this is the Tillman Island Drawbridge by Joseph 
Okay, can Joseph, let me tell Gersak, yes, okay, I made it harder than I thought it was going to be. Joseph, so I really enjoyed um, the way in which you put the paint to canvas so that it felt, again, like, like what we were looking at was, was freshly wet and couldn't really see. And you know how you're, you're just constantly doing this with your glasses, the sunspots around, around the lights and the car coming forward. And again, that kind of sense of sense of peril um, that isn't just the car coming at you, but also this incredible treatment of the trees and the, the, the setting around the bridge. And, you know, a drawbridge itself is a little bit nerve-wracking. And then the wooden drawbridge, and then the wooden drawbridge that's going to the island that's sinking. And I felt like you had captured, you had captured this in, in paint, the, the excitement and the, the scintillating feeling that you're experiencing something momentary. And it's not just momentary because you're there in the moment. It's momentary because it might not be there for that long. It also had a really, the, the architecture had a kind of old world feel to it. Um, and uh, at the same time, you can put a car right in the center of that. And I thought that was, that was really terrific. And I loved the use of the, the really bright colors, the, the unmediated paint um, that you peppered throughout the, the canvas that gave it almost a, um, an illustrative straight of quality, like a, and again, not the right word, but almost like a cartoon quality where you're, you're surprised and whimsical. It felt whimsical. So um, I wasn't really sure that I was going to be okay calling this the architectural. I think people were more expect, probably expecting me to choose a house, but you know, it's a bridge and um, there's a lot of architecture here. So. Go, go, Joseph. Thank you. Really beautiful and wonderful painting. Thank you. All right. Best marine painting. Um, as a specialist in British art, I love marine paintings. You can't do British art if you don't understand ships and boats. I mean, they made their empire through ships and boats. Um, and this one, and if you have a... I had a child who was obsessed with pirates, and so I spent a lot of time... Um, looking at ships and boats, I still can't tell you what kind they are. So Chesapeake Maritime Bay Maritime Museum, come and tell me. Um, but this one really, again, a watercolor. And looking at it closely, it felt so such an appropriate use of medium for the subject, which is interesting because boats are so architecturally thick and strong and solid, and watercolor is not a solid medium. So I liked that, that inter interchange. Um, I really thought the volumes that he created in the ship, that Orville um, G, um, which, yeah, okay, Orville G used, but I also really liked the, the way in which the, there are some very solid areas, um, not only of the ship, but also the pier leading the K, leading up to, uh, next to the ship. And then you have the person at the center, but you can't really tell that it's a person. But then you have these beautiful rendition of the ropes um, leading up the masts. And then this, this mast that here that is, and the sail that feels as if it, it's just about to unfurl. And I just thought that the way in which the medium was manipulated throughout the different areas differently um, just spoke really beautifully to how marine painting um, and particularly watercolor marine paintings have been done traditionally over time. So I really salute you um, and I, I also love that it was called a work in progress because it made the painting itself feel a little bit unfinished even though it was very finished. Um, and so thank you. Thank you, Orville. <clears throat> So Life of a Waterman um, was, this is sponsored by Anonymous Sponsor, um, and Life of a Waterman is a category for images that show the variety of life in this area um, by individuals who make their life 
style, um, their, their livelihood on the water. So it can be oysters, it can be fishing, it can be crab. It, and I just thought that this painting just encapsulated that world. And I think you can see why. Um, it's also exquisitely painted by Neil Hughes. And I was very excited that the artists chose this as their Artist Choice Award. So um, I think what What's wonderful here is this, it's actually the life of a water woman. There's a, a woman there in the middle. Um, so that was exciting to me. But the way in which the, the life of the water isn't what's up front. It's these incredible, um, incredibly volumetric buckets. It's the crab that you see painted that's, that's almost fading away because of the sea air that's on the wall. And it's these boats that feel at rest um, and getting ready to go out on the waters, but not in the midst of doing that. And the coloring um, that is pulled together in this woodwork, the woodworking, the way that the wood is, um, is expressed here in the middle, I thought it just draw, drew together this incredibly disparate set of spaces and it pulled our eye into the center, which is, is almost kind of an empty space. Even though it's filled with boats, it feels, it feels much less crowded than what's around it. And so I thought it was just a beautiful, beautifully rendered work that epitomized the life of the waterman again. And so thank you artists for choosing this. I'm sure you could speak much more beautifully about that. And congratulations, Neil. Life on the farm is also um, a specific award. And this one went to Henry Coe, who had two wonderful paintings of farm life. It was hard to choose which one. Um, this is one of the more sizable paintings in the exhibition, um, and the more, the, the more um, physically ambitious in terms of the, the size of the painting. So having to fill a canvas that size has a different set of cha cha challenges. It's not better or worse, it's just a different set of challenges. And I thought that this, um, again, this idea of what moment on the farm do you want to represent? What is the, what is the time of year? How do you populate? Where are the people? Where, is it just a, an animal scape, a farm scape? And this one really did, again, feel like you were in the field. You had been perhaps part of the, the hay baling. Um, and yet, there was something that, that made me, again, feel the kind of beauty and nostalgia for both this season of hay baling, but you know, what is the future of hay baling in, in, this, in this world right now? And that, to me, was the, that you have this incredibly beautiful old, old growth tree on the side. And then you have, right above the house, a tree that's really kind of struggling and um, is beautiful, but it's, it, it felt a little bit more like we're not sure what's happening here. And then I want to draw your attention to the beautiful use of color um, here on the right-hand side. And then again, the contrast between this kind of almost um, aggressively um, um, jewel, jewel tones that are over here, and then on the other side, the contrast that you have from, from these aggressively, beautifully, almost, almost like an opalescent area on the right side to this really wonderful area on the left, which is a kind of play in whites and, and the hues of the light, light blues. So, a really, really beautiful painting, and congratulations, Life on the Farm. So great. <clears throat> That's the Tidewater Farm Club and the Talbot County Farm Bureau. Okay, so clearly I like marine paintings. Um, and this is another watercolor. This is Mick McAndrews' Good Morning Oxford. And this one just, it just spoke to me again because of the the nature of the composition as being very frank. You know, he's, he's oriented this vertical painting with a boat in the middle and 
you know, that's potentially quite a mundane way of going about your com composition. But what he's done is he has, he has created this vertical column in the middle of, of this canvas, well, piece of paper, used the paper to animate the paint, the watercolor, and then taken the time to create two very different sides again. So you have a kind of empty atmospheric side on this hand. And then on this hand, you get very involved in looking at what, what is going on on the right hand side. But again, he's using atmospheric brushstrokes to depict these these individuals, the people who are there. And then you see the boat in the third boat in the background. And so it's almost like a little fleet of boats is going to come towards you. Um, and so the composition was something that really struck me. Uh, however, what I loved most of all about this was the way in which, Mick, you pulled, pulled or dotted the, the ropes of the sails up to the top so that I spent a lot of time looking in the lower register of the painting, but I spent more time looking, you know, pulling my eye up with each of those beautifully um, kind of just almost, almost like conducting. You were conducting your brush up to the top of the sail. And um, on, conversely, you could see them almost like a, a fall of confetti. And I thought that the use of the watercolor was just so brilliant to give you the idea of that, that shimmering that goes on when you're on a boat or at a port. And it's all in kind of one color ink. So that was the, the idea that you could get a shimmer from a monochromatic uh, work just was so exciting to me. So I love this. Thank you. September 1st, partner. So this is, we're getting, getting to the end. Um, this was by Zufar Big. Above. Zufar does amazing nocturnes, and he had two in this, and it was very hard to choose one. But this, this was the one that I kept coming back to. Um, the way in which Zufar was able to capture this brilliant moment of the moon on the water. Um, and it says it's a half moon, but you don't really see that at all. All you see is the full reflection in the water. So you're you're, you're thinking about what is the time of year. You, you start thinking immediately about how, how and when would you see this kind of thing. But it almost feels like a daylight picture because the sky is so beautifully um, variegated in its in the way in which the clouds are coming over the moon and then the dark on the left. But you feel you very much feel like you're in a in a sort of circular motion um, on the canvas. And then, frankly, just the way in which you've manipulated the paint across the canvas and picked out small areas of light. And you can see them in the foreground where, th where you're almost um, there. Again, I'm using the word sparkle in French, étincelle. You know, there, there are these little, little areas where your eye jumps across and just for me, this wasn't a nocturne. This was a painting about life on the water in a moment of deep com commune with nature and this, the beauty of what happens when the clouds and the water and the seashore and the pier and the boats all come together. So this was one that literally I would walk in the room and I could not not look at. And sometimes it's just that deep. So um, congratulations, Zufar. <laughs> All right, so I talked about the artist choice, which was the other one. So this is my grand prize. Um, this is sponsored by Ellen Votney. Thank you, Ellen. And um, this is the Timothy Dills Memorial Award. So um, I took very seriously the idea of um, who should get the grand prize. And, and like Zufar's painting that just caught my eye from the beginning, um, Charlie Hunter's work uh, 
was among the very first to catch my eye when I went into the, the, the rooms. It's very different from everything else in the rooms. And then on top of it, it, it requires you to come over and look at it. And when you get over to see it, it, it was mind-boggling to me. I am not, again, not a painter, not an artist. Um, how he was able to create this composition that comes together, strongly comes together, when each component of it is its own painting. And on top of that, in each component, you have very, very different techniques to create the volumes, very different techniques to create the truck. Um, and you have him pulling and pushing and scraping the paint across the canvas in ways that define the architecture. This could have also been the best architecture award in my mind. Define the spaces that you're in, but, but you, you get lost in each one of them. And so I spent probably 15 minutes looking at this little corner here, trying to imagine how he was able to get the sense of those weeds that are growing dried weeds, right? They're growing, but they're drying. And then these here are um, still part of this wheat. Is it wheat? Is it grass? What, what is it? But it is completely rendered completely differently than this. And at the same time, it, it really comes together as, as one area of this landscape. I was totally compelled by his, the way in which he was defining this side of this building and then using the paint immediately, very differently in a different direction to create this rounded um, silo. And then the contrast of the brown, on the strong brown on the one side and the very, very stark um, kind of bright, bright whites on this side, which you, know, you would think would would disorient and unbalance the painting, but it absolutely did not. And just to think about how detailed each little area was of this. And then I found out that he did two of these paintings um, in the short time that you had allotted. And I just, I just felt like this was one of, one of the very best uses of technique to create an atmosphere for the subject that, I, that I've seen. And I just want to salute you, Charlie. It, you blew me away. So that is what I will call casual speculations on work created very intently um, by amazing artists. Um, all of you have been incredibly patient with my um, musings. And um, I don't know if you would like me to answer any questions, or do you just want to get drinks and go buy more art? <laughs> All of that is fine. One question, no questions. Bueller. <laughs> thank you so, so much. And artists and winners, thank you. OK, I'm, wait. My friend, jo okay, all the artists. For, for the small oh, small paintings winners, please make your way to the podium and we will take a photo of you. Thank you again, everyone, for your attention.